The first one uh, is Esther chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Hear these words for your life. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Our next scripture reading comes from Acts, and it's verses, um, it's Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 31. <clears throat> Some men came down from Judah, Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul, telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the remnant of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who bear my name says the Lord who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses had been preached in every city from the earliest times, and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas and Silas, two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them, they sent the following letter. The, to the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we are sending Judas and Silius to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. 
it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad from its encouraging message. This is the word of the God for the people of God, and we say, Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our next scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, starting at verse 15 and reading to verse 20. Hear now these words of our Savior, these words of Christ. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and correct them when you are alone together. If they listen to you, then you've won over your brother or sister. But if they won't listen, take with you one or two others, so that every word may be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. But if they still won't pay attention, report it to the church. If they won't pay attention even to the church, treat them as you would a Gentile or tax collector. I assure you that whatever you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Whatever you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. Again, I assure you that if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, then my Father who is in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we have heard from your word. Now open up your truths to us. And having heard from you, we might respond accordingly. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Are any of you fans of the TV show The Office? It's no longer on anymore, but you know, it just ended a few years ago. And my wife and I love The Office. We still watch different episodes of it, and we own every season, and it's fun to go back and re-watch some of these episodes over and over and over again. Uh, if you know the show, you'll find it funny, I hope, that my wife has decided that I'm a lot like Michael Scott, um, and if you know the show, you mean that that means that, or you know that that means that my wife thinks that sometimes I act kind of like an idiot. Um, <laughs> one episode in particular that we love that kind of highlights who Michael Scott is, is um, an episode where Michael Scott, who is the manager of a branch of Dunder Mifflin, which is a paper sales company, is going out on a sales call with one of his salesmen. And they're driving down the road following Michael's GPS in his car to get where they're needing to go. And GPS tells Michael to take a right. And so Michael starts to turn right. The person next to him in the car starts yelling, no, no, don't turn right here. It's up ahead. If you turn right here, you're going to go off that pier. Michael turned right and went straight down a boat ramp into the water. Afterwards, when they're fishing out the car and everyone's talking to him like he's an idiot, he says, technology made me do it. Technology made me drive into the lake. Now, I thought this was hilarious when I first saw it. And honestly, I still laugh every time I, saw, I see it. But I gotta tell you, what I think is even funnier than watching this clip is realizing that they didn't make this up. That kind of stuff happens all the time with GPS devices and people driving. As I was researching for this sermon, I was going to show you the clip of The Office where Michael Scott does this, but I couldn't because I kept laughing at the different headlines that I saw. Man drives car into tree. GPS made me do it. Man drives car into shop. GPS made me do it. My favorite, though, was one that I have a picture of. The headline for this was, Women Drive SUV Into Swamp. GPS Made Me Do It. Now, that's nothing against the, the women drivers or anything, because like I said, I found plenty that were, were men doing it. But I thought it was hilarious. This is something that actually happens 
in our day and age. People will, in following the directions of their GPS, do things that we know are stupid. Do things that we know we shouldn't do, like drive into the lake or the swamp, as the case may be. This really happens. I, uh, I read a study that said that in the United States and in the United Kingdom, about 40% of all accidents, all traffic accidents, happen because of distracted drivers. Now, the number one cause for distracted driving is not GPS devices, it's what? Cell phones. Cell phones, yeah. Handheld devices, mostly texting, but even just talking on it is enough of a distraction, right? So, don't do that. I need to actually be reminded of that a few times myself. Don't do that once. The second leading cause, though, is GPS devices and following them whenever you should be able to tell that you probably shouldn't do that. And I think one of the reasons why this is the case is because we desire direction. We desire people to tell us what we should be doing in our lives and where we should be going. Maybe we not only desire it, maybe, maybe we need it. Maybe we as, as humans need good directions. Not just in our driving, but in our lives, in our faith as well. That's what the spiritual discipline of guidance is all about. It's about seeking God's direction in our lives. It's a, it's a spiritual direction that actually incorporates a number of the other ones we've talked about. Because in seeking guidance, you're supposed to use things like prayer and meditation and fasting as a way to hear the voice of God speaking in your life to give you that direction. The spiritual discipline of guidance shows us why fasting and prayer and meditation are so important. They install within us our own GPSs. You already for this? I came up with this myself. They install within us our own godly positioning systems. That's good, right? That's good? All right, y'all aren't near as encouraging as the early service. They laugh, okay? I just have a few little giggles. But whenever we seek out God's guidance, though, it's like we do have that GPS telling us where we need to go and what we need to do. A GPS device that will never send us into the water. This is why Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights before he started his official ministry. It's why the prophet Elijah hid in a cave until he heard the voice of God. It's why Queen Esther asked Mordecai and all the Jews in Susa to fast with her for three days and three nights so that she could make sure that she was engaging in the right cause of action, that she was following the right directions. Our GPS, our godly positioning systems, allow us to engage in what Paul says in Romans 12, 2, to know what God's will is by testing it in our world, acting in a certain way that allows us to live out God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And what's awesome is that once we know God's will, the spiritual discipline of, of guidance allows us and empowers us to do that will. So once we've been set on the right course of action, we're actually able to take steps towards seeing it through. Now, have you noticed so far as we've been talking in these last few weeks that all of the spiritual disciplines that we talk about are interconnected in some way? Whether we're talking about prayer or fasting or meditation or service or submission or simplicity or guidance or confession, all of these are connected in some way. Doing one usually means doing two or three others as you're engaging in it, which is good because... That's how we become better disciples, better individuals, is by engaging in these spiritual disciplines. What's interesting about the spiritual discipline of guidance, though, is that it's not only an individual discipline. It's also a corporate discipline. 
It's something that as the body of Christ, we are supposed to engage in together. Guidance is how the body of Christ hears and responds to its head, which is Christ. This is why seeking divine guidance as um, a corporate body is so important. It's what we're supposed to do as the body of Christ. It's kind of like the, uh, the ordination process that I'm engaged in right now in the United Methodist Church, to be a United Methodist pastor. I have to go through a process where I not only recognize that God is calling me into ministry, but the church has to recognize that call as well. I can say I'm supposed to be a pastor as much as I want. But if the church, the body of Christ, does not recognize that call in my life, it doesn't really mean anything. Guidance on a corporate level allows us as a church to function the way that God needs us to function. Because the truth is that we can do so much as individuals. The man or woman of faith truly can move mountains with his or her faith. But the greater truth is that whenever we work together as the united body of Christ, we can do exponentially more than we can as individuals. Whenever we seek God's guidance together and then act upon that guidance together, we can do exponentially more than we ever could by ourselves. But our actions have to be spirit-led. It's kind of like when our annual conferences meet to vote on delegates for general conference. Whenever we get together as the worldwide Methodist body, we always send delegates from all of the different annual conferences. And uh, A couple months ago, Brad and I went to our annual conference and we voted on delegates. And we engaged in a process where we were seeking godly guidance in who we voted upon. Now, this process is not supposed to involve any kind of politicking. It's not supposed to involve any kind of power plays. It's not supposed to involve anything where one person stands up and tells you why you should vote for me. Instead, we're supposed to be given a list of names. We're supposed to be given a brief summary on who the person is. And then we basically vote blind, without any kind of uh, pushes from any organization or any one person. And very rarely has anyone actually voted through in the first ballot. In fact, I've never seen it happen. It takes five, six, seven, eight ballots for us to get our delegates this way. Because what happens is the first ballot comes forth, and there isn't a two-thirds majority on anyone. And so we have to vote again and again. And in this process, we're supposed to be engaging in prayerful discernment on who we elect as our delegates. Sometimes there's a little politicking that goes in behind the scenes, but the point is that it's supposed to be spirit-driven, completely guided by God. The same process that happens in Acts 15. In Acts 15, the leaders of the early church gathered together to try and decide how to handle what was the hot-button issue for their time. Should Gentile Christians be circumcised before they engage the body of Christ? In other words, do the people who come from Gentile nations have to engage in Jewish practices before you can then be a Christian? This is something that split the church at the time. And so they came together to try to figure out what they were going to do about it. They heard arguments and stances from all of the different sides, and then they spent time in prayer and fasting to discern what God's will was. And then, and this is the cool part from Acts 15, they acted in unity on the answer. They acted as one body when they had their answer. They weren't a fractured people anymore, but they had sought God's guidance, and now they were acting upon it. 
You see, godly guidance is not about majority rule. It's not about getting that 51% of voters. It's not about compromise. Godly guidance is about God-given consensus based on scriptural unity. To get there, we need patience. And we need ears to hear from our God. In the text from Matthew that we read, we hear about how you're supposed to handle grievances between individuals. If I have a problem with my brother or sister, I'm supposed to try to solve it between me and that person. If that doesn't work, I bring in a couple of witnesses and try to figure it out. If that doesn't work, I bring it before the church. And if it still doesn't work, then I treat that individual as I would a tax collector or a Gentile. Now, just so we make sure we're all on the same page, how were tax collectors and Gentiles treated? With unconditional love. Okay? What Jesus is not saying here is that if someone disagrees with you and won't listen to the reason, you don't give them the boot. Instead, you say, oh, bless the heart. We're just going to love on you. That's how you handle someone whom you have a grievance with. But then Jesus says something really neat at the end of this section. He says, for where two or more are gathered, there I am. When we gather together as a body, Christ is with us. And so when we make decisions as the body of Christ, the idea is that we've made decisions with Christ, right? Well, what Jesus doesn't say here, because it should be common sense, is that we actually have to listen to the input that we get from God. We have to have ears to hear that guidance from the Spirit, that guidance from Christ who is there with us. Because you see, the spiritual discipline of guidance also includes the spiritual discipline that we talked about last week. Submission. A discipline that we usually don't want to hear about. Because submission means putting God's will above our own. When we seek God's guidance, what we're saying is God's goal is more important than my goal. God's will is more important than my will. And so I need to know how to seek it out. The hard truth, though, is that our own hard-heartedness and obstinance can actually hinder the Spirit's guidance in our lives and in the lives of those around us. We see this on a global, national, and local level playing out right now. You don't have to look very far or spend much time listening to the news to hear of things that are going on around the world where we need God's guidance. It doesn't take long when you turn on the TV to hear about what's going on in the Ukraine or to hear about what's going on in Israel. Conflicts that are way out of hand. Conflicts where we need to hear how the church is supposed to respond how we as the body of Christ are to act. It doesn't take long to hear about the immigration issue that is, by the way, right on our back door. And realize that we have a role to play as the church in what's going on. And we need to seek God's guidance in that. It doesn't take long to figure out that our church on a national level is split right now because of a number of different issues. Issues where we need to hear God's guidance, where we need God's direction. Even we as a local church are in a place where, you know, we've been spending a lot of time butting heads on different topics, different issues. We need to hear where God is calling us to go. We need to know the direction that God would have us travel, instead of focusing on the places where we want to go. We've got to figure out how, as the body of Christ, how God is calling us to stop talking, to open our ears, and to seek together God's will. For without God's guidance, we're not the body of Christ. We're simply individuals going in different directions. 
we're supposed to be united in the will of God. So may we actively seek to install our own godly positioning systems. May we be spirit-led and empowered to do God's will. May we seek to be the body of Christ, united in consensus, not majority rule. And may we submit our wills to God's guidance and act accordingly. Amen. Let's pray. God, give us guidance that we might hear from you and that we might respond to your will. In your name, amen.